One can argue that the Arovian uh, social welfare setup is too demanding and that is one of the reasons why uh, we got the impossibility result due to Arrow. So uh, in the Arrow's uh, social welfare setup, we are uh, looking at a complete ordering over the alternatives as an outcome of that uh, welfare function. Now this is this could be very demanding and the, the summary of uh, the Arrow's impossibility result can be said in the following uh, statement that uh, achieving a social ordering, so uh, remember that this f of r is nothing but a social ordering, it is giving and uh, taking as input all the preference orders over all the individuals, all the individual agents and taking and giving out one complete ordering. Uh, having the social ordering in a democratic way is impossible. That is what uh, Arrow's impossibility result is saying. So in order to mitigate this uh, um, impossibility, there had been uh, various attempts and we will discuss about two uh, such attempts uh, in this module and then uh, following modules. So the first setup is what is known as a social choice setting. Instead of an ordering, we are going to uh, the uh, the function that we are going to define will be giving out only one alternative and not a complete ordering. Uh, and the second way of handling this is uh, we'll see certain restrictions on the agent preferences. So maybe in 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 practice, agents preferences uh, cannot take all possible uh, orderings over uh, all the alternatives. And they have certain restrictions, certain um, uh, regularities and if we can use those regularities appropriately maybe we can uh, get rid of this kind of impossibility results so this brings us to the setup of social choice function so the function that we will be uh, uh, will be focusing on in this uh, setup the social choice setup is what is known as the social choice function Notice that the left hand side remains the same. The only difference is that now we are only considering strict preferences. Let's assume uh, that for now uh, in the social welfare setup, you are uh, looking at all uh, preferences which also included uh, indifferences. But here we don't allow for indifferences and we have only strict preferences. So if all these agents, all these N agents have their strict preferences given to this social choice function, this function F will pop out one alternative rather than the whole ordering over that uh, over that set of alternatives. So the most representative example could be that of voting or election. So let us uh, spend some time in discussing various voting rules because these are quite common and quite well studied and therefore for our own knowledge we can actually uh, know what are the different kinds of voting rules or election rules. So the first class of voting rules that we are going to discuss are called the scoring rules. So based on the uh, position on which uh, a specific voter keeps its alternative, so let's say we have um, alternatives A, B, C and so on and uh, the corresponding score that one gives to each of these positions is given by S1, S2, S3 and so on. And when we are looking at the uh, uh, the final outcome we are just taking so maybe for certain other or, uh, agent uh, B may have a have a topmost position A may have a second position and C similarly in that case the score will be S2 and S3 S1 S2 S3 for those things so uh, uh, in if there were these two um, uh, voters in this context then B would have a, a total score of S1 plus S2 Similarly, A would have S1 plus S2 and C would have got uh, twice of S3. So that is what this uh, scoring rule means. So we, we define scores and of course all these SIs uh, should be at least as much as SI plus 1. So these uh, scores are non-decreasing in nature. And there are various, uh, so and whoever has the highest score that, uh, uh, that alternative is uh, selected as the final outcome. So certainly this is a social choice function because we are taking individuals preferences, we are only defining certain uh, scores and uh, finally we are popping out one particular alternative. 
breaking ties arbitrarily. So there are certain special cases. Uh, the most uh, uh, popular one or the things that we can, uh, the, the voting rule where we can uh, associate most of the time is what is known as plurality. You have the topmost uh, position, the topmost score to be equal to 1 and all other scores to be equal to 0. So you just count the topmost vote and this is exactly how we, um, uh, we have our usual elections, uh, um, Lok Sabha or the Vidhan Sabha elections. So they have, um, they only, uh, the voters only cast their most favorite candidate which you can consider as uh, giving the score of 1. For all the other agents, you don't really ask uh, these agents, uh, the, uh, ask the voters uh, to reveal them. So the veto is, uh, is another type of uh, uh, scoring rule where you have only one alternative which you don't want to um, uh, include. For all the other uh, alternatives, you have the same score of one. Borda is, a, is named after a, a French uh, mathematician who, uh, and also a social scientist uh, who has given this, uh, um, uh, this kind of a score where you start with the M minus, if there are M uh, different alternatives, you start with the M, uh, M minus 1 of, uh, as the score of the first one and then M minus 2 for the second one and so on up to m uh, the final one so the uh, the s of m minus 1 will be equal to 1 and the final one will have a score of 0 so this is how this uh, uh, this border voting rule is defined harmonic has this scores to be uh, the harmonic series and for k approval you have the first k uh, most preferred alternatives which is having the uh, score of 1 and for the rest, M minus K, you have zeros. That's uh, the set of uh, scoring rule based mechanisms. Now, there are uh, slight modifications of this plurality rule, which is known as the plurality with runoff. So there are two phases in this kind of a voting rule. In the first phase, all the candidates participate and people cast their votes in the usual plurality form. And then the, the top two candidates are selected and then all the voters are asked to vote again. And this is, uh, and uh, so uh, after the first phase, everybody except the top two has been eliminated. So some of the votes which were cast by the uh, by certain voters uh, wh whose uh, favorite candidate has been eliminated, they are given another chance to pick, um, uh, pick uh, uh, one of the candidates from these top two candidates. And this is exactly what is done in the French presidential election. It is done using pl plurality with runoff. Uh, we'll discuss a couple of more uh, voting rules. The, the the third voting rule is the maximum mean. So what uh, what it does is uh, it selects the candidate with largest margin of victory. Now, what is a margin of victory? This is the number of votes that you need to delete or alter uh, in order to change the current outcome. So, for instance, A was currently being uh, uh, happening to be the winner. What is the uh, minimum number of votes that you need to change in order to make someone else a winner? And that is called the margin of victory. In some sense, this is uh, the, the, the closest um, opposing uh, voter, uh, opposing candidate uh, whose votes can be altered. So if, uh, if someone, so let's say A was beating its closest competitor uh, by a margin of let's say 100 votes, and if that 100 votes can could be altered, then uh, you can uh, make the, the closest competitor to be the winner. So this is something like the minimum number of votes in order to change the outcome. And you are trying to find out who has this highest margin. So that is the reason why it is called maximum. mean. The, the, the fourth type is the Copeland rule. So now we can uh, think about a pair of uh, uh, candidates and look at what happens in the pairwise election. So we remove all the, so we have the total uh, uh, ordering of all the agents over these candidates. And uh, we uh, look at uh, pairwise, uh, let's say A and B, and remove all the other candidates. So whether they are, uh, so who is winning in this pairwise election? Uh, and if uh, A wins uh, the pairwise election with uh, against B, 
then we are giving uh, giving a a score of one and similarly for all uh, possible pairs so all m minus one uh, different elections uh, pairwise elections for that particular candidate we are looking at who, who is becoming the winner so copeland rule is essentially who has the largest score uh, based on that pairwise elections uh, he uh, that candidate is going to be the winner now in this case uh, there is an interesting observation that you one can make um, again uh, copeland uh, is it's named after copeland uh, similarly, there is a, a idea of a Condorcet winner. So now, now what is a Condorcet winner? You can think of again the pairwise elections um, and uh, if there exists one candidate, one specific uh, uh, alternative which beats every other candidate in pairwise election, uh, then we are going to call that winner a Condorcet winner. And it is not guaranteed to exist. Such kind of a Condorcet winner can, may not exist. And here is one example, so very simple example with three voters and three um, candidates. So uh, maybe these three agents have this uh, three um, uh, preference orders over these three candidates, A, B, and C. What you can see is that A is beating uh, B in a pairwise election. So A is above B in two cases and B is above A in only one case. So A is beating A in a pairwise election. Similarly, C, uh, so sorry, B is beating C in pairwise election. B is above C here, but C is above B here. So B is also beating uh, uh, C in um, pairwise election. But the interesting thing is C is also beating A in pairwise elections. So there does not exist any uh, sp uh, any specific candidate who is beating every other candidate in pairwise election. So therefore, a Condorcet winner might not exist. But uh, we can define something like if there exists some preference profile where Condorcet winner exists. So, of course, this is one counter example, but you can also create certain examples where the Condorcet winner actually exists. Uh, if that Condorcet winner exists, then the voting rule, uh, those kind of voting rules that uh, returns that Condorcet winner as the outcome, uh, those kind of uh, voting rules are called Condorcet consistent. I mean, the name itself is saying a lot. So, uh, if there exists a Condorcet winner, then uh, the voting rule will give that Condorcet winner as the outcome. And it is not very difficult to see that uh, Copeland is going to be Condorcet consistent uh, because of the very reason that if there exists a Condorcet winner, that means it is winning all possible pairwise elections, then that particular uh, uh, winner or the candidate will have a score of a minus one it is beating everybody else in pairwise elections now uh, if you look at any other candidate that candidate uh, will have uh, less than a minus one score because it is at least being uh, in the pairwise election against that previous candidate uh, who is the Condorcet winner it is losing against that so it can win at most a minus one cases but it will lose uh, uh, definitely to that candidate and therefore its score cannot beat the score of that Condorcet winner. So therefore Copeland will give that uh, Condorcet winner the highest score and that will be the winner. So that's uh, very standard. I mean Copeland uh, is essentially Condorcet consistent by its design itself. But some of the voting rules that we are uh, quite familiar with, we use it uh, uh, quite often. Um, that is not Condorcet consistent and this is uh, uh, sort of a, uh, uh, a fallacy in itself. The plurality rule is so much used in all possible cases, it does not satisfy uh, this very uh, idea of Condorcet consistency. So Condorcet consistency is something like very natural thing, right? So you are looking at a candidate which is beating everybody else in pairwise elections. It will be very unjustified for a voting rule not to select that candidate as a winner. But you, you can see that uh, in plurality it does not happen. So here is an example. So suppose there are again uh, three sets, three different types of voters. Uh, by type I mean that uh, their uh, preference profile remains the same. The preference ordering among these three candidates remain the same. So 30% of these voters prefer A over B over C. The other 30% uh, uh, thinks that B is above A, A is above C and there is 40% which thinks C is above A, A is above B, right? 
Now, if you look at the pairwise election situation, you see that A is above B in 40 plus 30, that is 70 percent of the case. So, it, A beats B in pairwise election by a score of 70 to 30. Similarly, A also beats C. Here you can see that A is above C uh, for this 30 percent and 30 percent. So, it also beats C. Uh, with a margin, I mean, um, um, with a margin of 60% to 40%. Now, clearly, A is the Condorce winner because it beats all other candidates uh, in pairwise election. Now, if you look at the plurality rule, so plurality rule uh, just looks at the topmost um, uh, vote. So, every agent, every voter is asked to cast its ballot. Uh, for the, the for their most favorite candidate and in that case a will get only 30 percent of the vote b will get 30 percent of the vote c will get 40 percent of the vote and therefore c is going to be the winner in plurality which is not uh, the condorse winner condorse winner was a so actually you can uh, uh, prove it even more generally you can create counter examples for any kind of scoring rule so no scoring rule based mechanism that we have discussed uh, in, in, in the beginning, all this plurality, veto, borda, harmonic, k approval, none of them are actually Condorcet consistent. This is, this is quite uh, amazing. Okay, so let us now go back to the social choice functions setup. We have this function f which is mapping the individual uh, preference orders to this set, uh, to the uh, set of uh, all alternatives or all candidates. Now we are going to define a, f uh, a few uh, things, few uh, notions which will be useful for the uh, for de developing them. Uh, the conditions and the results involving social choice functions. So the first thing is Pareto domination. So we can call an alternative A to be Pareto dominated by B if uh, very naturally that alternative is strictly dominated by B by all the agents. So B is strictly preferred to A by all the agents. Now we talk about Pareto efficiency uh, for a social choice function. So we call a social choice function to be Pareto efficient if there exists, uh, is, if for every preference profile where uh, you have a dominated uh, alternative, uh, then that uh, social choice function will never output that dominated uh, alternative as an outcome. So in every preference profile, let's say A is Pareto dominated, then uh, the F of P can never be equal to A. So, which is quite natural. Why should uh, the society choose an alternative which is which ha has a better alternative than that one by all the agents? So, Pareto of efficiency is uh, is the first property that we will be looking at, and unanimity by the name itself uh, says what it is. So, we are going to call a social choice function to be unanimous if you have uh, a preference profile where the top alternative of all the agents are the same. So they agree on the topmost alternative, then the outcome should also be the topmost alternative, right? So this is this is what it means that if the the topmost so p um, p i k is the kth preferred alternative of this agent i. So p uh, one one means the it is the topmost alternative, uh, the most preferred alternative of player one. Okay, so that is unanimity. Now we can actually start drawing a um, uh, relationship between this Pareto efficiency and unanimity already. So we, we observe and uh, uh, I claim that Pareto efficiency will imply unanimity. So what does that mean? That uh, if we have a Pareto efficient social choice function that should also be unanimous. Why is that? So we'll have to show, so suppose we start with a social choice function which is Pareto efficient and we'll have to show that that is unanimous as well. Now for unanimity, uh, the if condition itself is that uh, this is going to be, um, the topmost alternative is going to be the same for all the, uh, for all the voters or all the agents. So let's say that is the, uh, that is given to you that the topmost alternative is the same. And now my social choice function is also Pareto efficient. That means it will never take, um, uh, it will never output uh, an alternative which is Pareto dominated. Now, because A is the topmost, uh, then A actually Pareto dominates all other alternatives. 
So you cannot really pick any of the other alternatives apart from A because that is pair to dominated by A. So uh, if you just rule out all the possibilities, the final thing that you have uh, left with, you are left with is A and therefore uh, f of P has to be equal to A because of the property of pair to efficiency. So which is essentially nothing but unanimity. So if we have a, a pair to efficient uh, um, a social choice function, um, then we, we can show that that is uh, unanimous. And we have also used this uh, strict containment that is pair to efficient is a strict subset. The, the social choice functions which are pair to efficient is a strict subset of the unanimous social choice functions. Why is that? So you can consider, I mean, breaking the condition of una unanimity is very simple. You can, of course, whenever you have uh, the top alternatives to be the same, the social choice function should be equal to A. But imagine a situation where all the topmost alternatives are A, but except for one agent, let's say B. And for that, A lives somewhere below and maybe there is C. And C is possibly a, a pair to dominated by A. So uh, for this kind of a preference profile, you cannot really uh, apply, I mean, uh, this, uh, it could be unanimous uh, because it, uh, um, uh, it does not satisfy this condition so the social choice function can actually output something and let us assume for this particular social uh, this particular preference uh, profile f is actually outputting c which is a Pareto dominated thing so uh, this is this f is not violating the uh, condition of unanimity whenever all the uh, topmost positions are same uh, then f of uh, f of that uh, uh, preference uh, profile should be equal to that uh, topmost alternative but when it is not even if you puncture one uh, one uh, preference uh, order of one agent you pick something which is paired or dominated and that is uh, that is not paired or efficient that social choice function will not be paired or efficient even though it is unanimous so that is uh, one example why this is this uh, containment is essentially strict. Okay, the third definition that we are going to discuss is uh, that of ontoness. So we are going to call a social choice function to be onto and this onto is just the the natural normal definition of function ontoness that for all alternative uh, A in A, uh, so lowercase a in the set of alternatives, there must exist some preference uh, profile, preference profile P of A, let's say, uh, in that uh, script p hold to the n such that if you apply f on that you get get back that alternative a as your output and this is also very similar i mean the the uh, this implication of unanimity implying ontoness is, is uh, pretty straightforward all that you can you uh, do here is uh, pick the the a on top and because of unanimity you will you will always output and the f will always output for this kind of a preference uh, profile the outcome uh, of a so no matter whichever alternative you pick you if you pick b you can uh, replace all the topmost positions with b and apply unanimity and you will get uh, b as your outcome so therefore it is uh, uh, i mean that f will always be on to so therefore unanimity is also going to be on to now you can uh, i can leave this as an exercise to show that this containment is also strict so you can have some social choice function which is on to but not unanimous so let's try doing that okay so let us move on to the next definition and this is the uh, this is the place where we are actually talking about strategic behavior so manipulability we haven't thought about uh, manipulability when we talked about the arrows impossibility result uh, in particular, even before that, when we were discussing the revelation principle, we had actually spoken about the manipulability. So let us get back to that point um, in this uh, domain of social choice functions. So we are going to call a social choice function f to be manipulable if there exists a player and a preference profile p such that uh, for player for that player i, if that uh, player is uh, reporting misreporting its preference to be pi prime uh, and other players are actually uh, choosing their uh, uh, corresponding p minus i 
then it is better for for that agent so uh, you know that this uh, outcome this f of pi prime p minus i is one outcome let's say this is a and this outcome is b so then uh, by misreporting it is getting an alternative which is more preferred uh, than the outcome if he, it was not misreporting so we have seen uh, this uh, this kind of a definition in the context of cardinal preferences and this is ordinal preferences uh, about dominant strategy incentive compatibility so you can just um, uh, invert or uh, negate this statement of non manipulability in that case what you will get is that for all agents i and for all profiles p uh, the the inequality so this will essentially flip that is you don't get so f of pi uh, comma p minus i should be at least as good as uh, f of pi prime p minus i that we have already defined as uh, do, um, uh, truthfulness or dominant strategy incentive compatibility here we are defining it in the reverse way that is manipulability so uh, when we are talking about manipulability let's look at some examples how uh, s some of this uh, known voting rules can be manipulated so again the uh, the usual suspect is plurality so let's say that uh, we are having this plurality where we are just asking uh, each of these agents to uh, report their most uh, valuable most preferred uh, candidate and we are uh, counting how many of them are there and breaking the tie in favor of A over B over C. So let's say uh, there are four voters who are having this kind of a vote, four voters who has this kind of a vote, and there is exactly uh, one voter who has this kind of a vote. So what is what is happening is that uh, the it is being tied between A and B, and um, uh, this particular individual, this last individual, is sort of a tiebreaker. Now it it sees that if it uh, reports its uh, uh, vote truthfully, then uh, according to this uh, tie-breaking rule, A is going to be the winner, which is its uh, worst uh, preferred alternative. Instead, if it uh, changes its uh, preference to B, it votes for B, then uh, what it gets is at least better than that. It knows that C has no chance of winning in this plurality vote and uh, uh, it uh, chooses to vote for its second best candidate and therefore it is manipulable you, you can see this uh, by this definition you, you could already find some pi prime for this particular agent such that it gives them a strict better payoff and this is something that you uh, you, you have possibly seen uh, uh, or uh, at least uh, think about uh, uh, seeing this kind of a situation in real elections the second case is about Copeland. Now, plurality we know because this is a scoring rule based mechanism. This is not Condorcet consistent. But Copeland is Condorcet consistent. Again, the, the tie breaking rule we know that it is in favor of A over B over C. And uh, what we are going to see in Copeland uh, mechanism, Copeland voting rule, is that we are looking at pairwise uh, elections and we are giving scores for that. Now, A beats B in pairwise election but loses to C so therefore A has a score of 1 similarly if you look at uh, B and C you can see that their score is also 1 so if it is truthful so if um, all agents are revealing their uh, uh, preferences truthfully then uh, A is going to be the winner because that's the tie breaking but now you can see that uh, this particular individual and uh, here there are exactly one uh, voter in each of these classes so uh, A is the least preferred alternative for this uh, agent here and if it re reports let's say C above B so then at least it it gets C to be the winner uh, because in that case C will uh, uh, beat in a pairwise election even B so C will be the, uh, the uh, Copeland winner and therefore uh, C is at least uh, C is a strict preferred alternative than A which was going to be the winner otherwise so we can see that again according to the same definition of uh, manipulability we found pi prime uh, for this particular agent which uh, uh, which essentially is beneficial for it uh, than its true true preference uh, ordering okay so we are going to call that uh, a social choice function to be strategy proof this is the term uh, strategy proof we are coining for the first time 
yeah, we'll be using this uh, interchangeably with truthful, um, incentive compatible, and so on. So strategy proof, uh, if it is not manipulable by any agent at any profile. So essentially, we'll have to negate this statement, the, the manipulability statement, and we can uh, uh, write an equivalent statement uh, accordingly. And as we have discussed, for all i in, in n and for every profile p, uh, the, the opposite of this, uh, uh, this implication should hold. So what is the implication of strategy proofness? Uh, let us uh, define a few things in order to uh, in order to understand this. So uh, we define what is known as a dominated set of a specific alternative A at a uh, preference of PI. So as the name suggests, these are the set of all those alternatives which are below A in this preference profile uh, in this preference PI. So let's say in this example we have uh, this alternative D and uh, this uh, this dominated set of D under this PI is nothing but A and C which are uh, below that particular alternative in this preference order. So that is what it means. This is the formal definition and this is the this is an example. The second uh, the other definition that we are going to use uh, here is that of monotonicity. So what is monotonicity? Um, we are going to call a social choice function to be monotone if for any two preference profiles let's say p and p prime uh, with the first in the first preference profile the outcome or the uh, the social choice function outcome is going to be equal to a and this domin uh, dominated sets are essentially increasing in its size so if we go from pi to pi prime we see that the dominated set all the uh, candidates, all the alternatives that were below A in PI continues to be uh, below below A in PI prime. There could be some new alternatives which are now going below that. So in some sense, A's relative position is actually weakly increasing in, in PI prime than in PI. Then this uh, monotonicity is saying that uh, F of PI prime should also be equal to A and this should hold. So this uh, dominated set uh, condition should hold for all agents in uh, i in n so every agent is now uh, having more alternatives which are uh, uh, which are worse than a so if we already have um, uh, outputted the, the the social choice function has outputted uh, the alternative a uh, then why uh, it should continue to output it uh, uh, even in this new preference profile that is what monotonicity means so here is one example. So let's say this is our P. Uh, so uh, so uh, for all the uh, different uh, alternatives, for, for all the different uh, uh, agents, these, these are, are the positions, positions of A. And uh, this is in P. And in P prime, what is happening that they are actually uh, climbing a little above. So maybe A is climbing above. So that means some of the other alternatives which were here, let's say B or C, they are now coming down and uh, sitting below. All the alternatives which are below it are always and they uh, still remain below A. Uh, and similarly here for all the agents. But now new, uh, uh, possibly some new alternatives are also coming below that. So A's relative uh, position in this uh, is uh, weakly increasing. So if, uh, so the monotonicity is essentially saying this, uh, if f of p was a, so in this uh, preference profile, if your outcome was a, then here also you should have a as your outcome. If you apply f to it, it should output a and that is monotonicity. Now uh, let us conclude with uh, one result and we'll prove it next time. Uh, if a social choice function is strategy proof, then uh, it implies and is implied by uh, monotonicity, uh, if and only if condition.